also bingo. Um, in bingo, because I have a random number generator that generates a sequence of numbers, and I seed that random, random number generator, I can predict all the numbers that are going to come out in the future of that random number generator because it's in the computer. So I can work out who's going to get the numbers they need to do bingo. Now, I also have all of the cards, the opponent cards, the AI bingo cards. And because I can calculate those, I can look at a card and go, oh, that won't be exciting for the player because that card doesn't have any interesting numbers on it and so it won't even get close to winning. So I throw that one away and I only select cards which will lose but lose in interesting ways. Right? That make the player feel, oh, oh, it's tight, oh, he's almost won, he's almost won, yay, I won. Right? Because the tension is more important than the actual who wins and loses. And so in, in game AI, we are creating an experience, right? We're trying to get the player to feel something. We have some challenges we, with AIs because although we like making clever AIs that are good at playing game, the designer has objectives in their game and, AI, and the AI needs to support that. Right? So if the game has a point of, um, you know, the, the AIs will run away at this point, if you let your AIs be too clever and they realize that running away is not a good idea at that point, then they should run away. Um, and then your play, the game designer will get angry at you. Um, in some of the first, um, I think it was in, in some of the Civ games, where they, the the the, um, the later ones where they have individual units that were were pathfinding and attacking, um, they actually gave them realistic values, and they found that yes, about forty percent of the army ran away immediately because they knew that they might die, and so they fled which is about what actual happened in actual wars of about that time, is that a lot of the soldiers would just run away, right? As soon as, as, soon as they, the, the general was no longer looking at them, off they scatter, right? You know, they don't want to die. Um, and if you make your AIs intelligent, they realize, wait a minute, if we attack there, we're going to die. No, no, I'm just going to walk away. Um, which makes it hard to script your battle scene when a whole bunch of your units are taking independent decisions and being intelligent and going off and doing the wrong thing. Um, when you're when you're making even like a, a, a side scroll or a, a top down shooter, um, vertical scrolling, what the AI should do is they should coordinate and fire a stream of bullets across the screen. They shouldn't fire at you; they should just fire a heat and create a curtain of bullets that you can't escape. That's the intelligent thing to do because that would always beat the player. But no, no, they all fire at you so that all the bullets come towards you so you can sit sideways and they will miss you and you feel clever for having worked out where to be to avoid the bullets. Right? Now, um, it was... Uh, and so in the, in, in the American Civil War, one of the problems they had was people shooting an, uh, someone who was noticeable. So one of the rules they had in the Civil War was that you do not shoot at a person. You shoot ahead. You don't look at what you're shooting at. You shoot at chest height forward to create a wall of bullets. Because otherwise, what happens is you get some crazy guy on the other team and he like gets 50 bullets in him, and the other 49 guys come charging across the field while you're reloading your musket. Right? This is not a good way of fighting. So, so, so the idea was you don't shoot at the person. You just create a wall of bullets to kill as many as you can. So, <clears throat> the AIs being intelligent might defeat the goal of the designer. So we have to support the designer. We have to do AI in real time. There's a lot of AI systems that are really brilliantly clever, but they take, you know, 10, 15 minutes to make a move. And that's just not going to work, right? It's, well, I mean, if you're playing chess, maybe, and someone's, you know, having a few Chianti's and <laughs> watching some TV or something while they wait for the AI to make a move. But um, you're, you've got to do real time in, in games. Um, our AIs need to be scriptable. Now this is one of the interesting things for all AIs, which I think is going to come up in what I was talking about last week in Lillehammer, 
was how to manage AIs, that there is some sense of parameter setting in an AI. That when you get in your autonomous car, you get to set some parameters about that car, right? So you get to say, you know, um, you know, I, I don't trust people in roundabouts, so when you plot your path, try and avoid the roundabouts, right? And the AI car will go, okay, I'll avoid the roundabouts. And you can say, you know, um, I've got four hours to get to Oslo, so plot a path that is the safest possible path that will get me there in four hours. Right? And so it will slow down and it will kind of take side roads or it will, it will work out what is the absolute safest way of getting to Oslo for you. Right? But you can see a parameter and say, well, we know, no, I need to get to Oslo in two hours, so you need to take the legally fastest route. Right? So, so there's some sort of controllability. Um, in, in game AIs, we need the same controllability. We need the ability to, to interact with our AIs. Um, and comprehensibility. We need the AIs, to, we need the player to understand what the AI is thinking. Because if I don't know what the AI is thinking, I either don't care, I, you've done all this work and it's just random so I don't care. Uh, and I won't create a narrative around what the AI is doing and so I, I'll be surprised by it. Um, and unfortunately, humans aren't great at comprehending things. So um, my friend Andrew, when he was working on, on um, the Batman games uh, with Mr. Freeze, um, one of the things that Mr. Freeze would do when, in the first build of Mr. Freeze was that he would, he would look at Batman running through a gap in a wall or through down the window um, and he would then say ah if Batman continues running at the same velocity he'll come out at that gap now and so he'd fire a rocket at the gap and you as Batman would run into his rocket and get and, and die or get hit right now the player playing this thought it was horrible because he was cheating, right? Because they, they were sure that Mr. Freeze was watching them through the wall and cheating. And no, no, he was just being clever AI and just doing a movement prediction. And so they had two options. They either did the comprehensibility thing and say, and have Mr. Freeze say, I've seen you, I know where you're running to. Right? to try and tell the player that Mr. Freed was making a prediction so the player could stop, watch the rocket, and go, ha ha, I outwitted Mr. Freeze. Right? So they either kind of had to tell them what was going on or just let Mr. Freeze be a bit stupid. Right? Um, and, you know, it's easier to not do the voice acting. <laughs> and so it was easier to drop that prediction, particular prediction. Now, um, my... My colleague um, at, at university, when he was playing um, Chris Butcher, when he was playing Marathon, it was amazing to watch because he did that with everybody in the map. Right? He somehow was able to keep a, a location information about where you were. So he'd be running along the map, and he would like you'd see someone. You'd be watching his screen, and you'd see him turn as he as he was running, and you'd see someone on the other side of the arena go through a window. He would then run to the next window and fire off a rocket at an opening. And then, there, and then you'd, you'd see he would fire the rocket and it would bang, woo! <laughs> as, as he hit them perfectly. So he'd, he'd spot it and then he'd continue. He didn't stop and watch. He just continued and then looked for the next person to make predictions on where you were running and what you were doing. And he was nearly impossible to beat because just he was able to keep that map of everyone. But, you know, that felt like he was cheating. And so if your AI is just intelligent, your player might blame it. Um, I had a, a friend's father said he never played online, he never played poker against the computer because the computer could see his cards. Because he said, well, you know, if it can show me the cards, then it can see them. So that can never be fair. <laughs> Which is a kind of really understanding how we program stuff, right? But it's, it's an understandable idea, right? That the player might think your AI is cheating if it's too intelligent. So you had one of these two options. Um, they went um, with controlling the AI, making it a bit stupider 
rather than making it comprehensible to the player. Um, in the Bungie case, when the little dudes run away, they made that comprehensible by having the, the wee guys, when you shoot the boss, the Lee guys made the big arm movements and was all terrifying, right? So um, you can have some choices here about how you communicate what your AI does. Emergent AI and scripted AI. Um, you guys had the Boyd stuff? You did Boyd's? Yeah, so that's an example of merging. Just a couple of simple rules, and like the complexity in Go is a bunch of simple rules that create massively complex interactions. Um, that's hard to control, right? When things emerge, you have to play with the levers and hope that somehow it re-emerges in a different way. Um, and if it's a chaotic system, right? So if it has chaos, um, if you use chaos theory in your, guys understand chaos theory? Have you heard of chaos theory? Yeah. Do you know what it means? No. Okay. So you're kind of you're on the first level of understanding chaos theory as I've heard the term before, and it's got something to do with tornadoes and butterflies. Oh yeah. 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 <laughs> so but you don't know much more than tornadoes and butterflies. Do you know how butterflies into tornadoes? Flap the wings. <laughs> that's a very big butterfly. Um, you've been watching Mothra, haven't you? Um, so yeah, so emergence is generally very hard to control. And the idea is that when you have a, a system that is either finely balanced or is in a, in a process that is starting out, if you imagine that you're a rock on the pinnacle of a, of a hill, I tip it a little bit one way and suddenly it rolls off and ends up um, um, like 10 miles that way. And if it tips just the other way, suddenly it's 10 miles the other way, right? So, so a, a chaotic system has these little wee fine decision points where small changes somehow have massive repercussions at the end of the system. But also they interact and, for, and, and feed on each other, um, which is also why you know um, weather systems are hard to predict because they have small changes here might make massive difference later. So we change in direction, means you hit some, a bit of land which slows you down or you pick up more water and so you, get, you increase in size. So there's these small changes. Scripted AI, where we'll look at the code today, is where you as a designer control what the AI does, right? And you've all had this, you know, you've got a, a line where you know when I step over the line, suddenly all the enemies are gonna spawn, right? So you can identify some of these points, particularly if you've played the game before, and you go, oh, ah, right, you know, I'll go and click all my ammo, and I'll get my health ready, and I'll see it myself, and really, and support enemies. <laughs> so, yeah, um, that's a scripted event that's going to spawn things at a known time or at, with a known event. So, we have some middleware. Um, so, we have some, there are uh, increasingly game AI middleware. Um, some of these run on, on GPUs, and the, the idea is that <coughs> you guys shouldn't have to write AI algorithms from scratch. You should just use tools that you can say, right, make me a pathfinding, like, add a pathfinding component to this um, NPC in Unity, right? So if you've got an, an entity component system, you could have AI components that you could just add to things. And then, you know, when it's got the pathfinding component, you can send an instruction to that entity to say, go to there and it will work it out, right? So you don't have to write any pathway, you don't have to write any of that AI, you just drop the AI component in. Um, and so there are more of these libraries that are being offered. The, the challenge is that because games are defined by their rules and AIs have to play within the rules, every new game means new AI. So it's it's hard to get a universal middleware that does it the same in every game and does it right because the whole point is that your game is slightly different in its rules from other games, right? Otherwise, you're just a clone of that first game. So the AI has to be specific to your game unless your game is a clone. Um, and so... These generic solutions are challenging. The advantage is uh, it does take time to write AI, um, and it takes time to understand how AI works. So uh, there are, usually time means money, 
Uh, you guys are probably pretty terrible at working out how much it's costing to have you in this room. If you were a development team, right, if this was a company and we were having an hour long meeting and you guys are all earning you know, 500, 600,000 a year, uh, which means our business costs are about a million a year right, per person. Uh, you work 1,600 hours in a year, so you take a million, you divide it by 1,600, and there are, how many, there are about 25 of you in here, 20 of you in here. Um, even at, at simple odds, that's about 10,000 an hour. I think it's about 10,000 an hour. Maybe it's 100,000 kroner an hour. Maybe 10,000 kroner an hour. Cruises to scale. It's in that range, right? So unless this meeting adds, I think probably 100,000 kroner. How much? Um, 625 per person times 25. Yep. About 15,000 an hour, right? So unless this meeting adds 15,000 kroner to our product, then we're losing money. Right? So this is a three hour, this is a two hour session, so it's worth 30,000 kroner. I'm sorry for one hour right now, so it's 30,000. Yeah, so it's 30,000 for this, right? So 30,000 kroner is what value we need to add to, to, the, to, the, to the product. Right? And you're selling them at, you know, a mobile app at 20 krona, 10 krona to download the app. This meeting has to add 3,000 sales to our product. That'd be a good lecture, man. <laughs> That'd be an awesome lecture, right? So, you know, your time in the future is massively expensive. So, when you're evaluating the cost of using an AI system versus doing it yourself, you have to stop thinking like a student and start thinking like a professional and saying, yes, of course it's cheaper to buy it because it means that I, instead of taking 20 hours to do this, I only take 10. Right? Because 10 hours of my time is worth the, the cost they're asking for. Right? That's a hard transition. Um, I know one of, one of, one of my uh, friends when she started working, um, actually came to Norway, and she walked the 20 minutes from the bus stop to her home carrying her backpack. And when she got home, she went, wait a minute, I've got a job and money. I could have got a taxi. Right? Because it just never occurred to her that getting a taxi was an option because she'd been a student for so long that her brain had just got to, no, no, I walk everywhere because I have no money. Um, and so you guys need to make that transition. It's very hard as students to do that, right? Because you learn how to eat noodles and not spend money. But understanding <laughs> cost when you transition out into the workplace, you need to, you need to be able to do it, right? And it takes some time. Um, also, technical support. Sometimes it's hard to know if an AI middleware tool will have good technical support. Um, if you have nobody in your company with any AI experience, uh, you might actually not just use this as technical support, you might use this as kind of learning support. Because <laughs> um, you ask them questions and they go, oh God, not those. And so they start explaining how AI works to you. Um, because it's part of their technical support package. Um, if, however, you get a bad technical support package and they're charging you, you know, a thousand kroner an hour that you're talking to them, then yeah, that might not be a good bet. You might want to go online and learn yourself. Okay, so disadvantage, you get a generic AI solution. The problem, te the problem solving techniques might, might not fit your game and what you're trying to achieve. And so you only get some of what you need and then you have to program the rest yourself and you have to make sure they're consistent and it, it can be a challenge. And also you lose some of the control that you'd otherwise have if you were making your own AIs. Right, so, what techniques do we use? And which ones do you know? You all know A-star, yes. Including the foreign students. There's some nodding of A-star in. Um, finite state machines. Vaguely nodding, yes. Uh, scripts. Okay, good. Uh, do you know scripting, or do you know, like, templated scripts? So the, the waiter script is a standard one that so the waiter script and script, the scripting in this case, and scripts, um, is the idea that you have a, a standard sequence of things you know are going to happen. So you have a script, like a play script, and then your AI is just filling in the blanks, right? So as a waiter, 
you have a script that's saying, go up to the table, ask if they want drinks, wait for responses, write down responses. Once you get the response to the drinks, you say, ah, are you ready to order? They say yes, you do this. If they say no, go away, come back in five minutes. Right? So you have a script of your behavior, and then it has decision points where the interaction with the AI will determine which part of the next part of the script you play. Right? So that's a scripted interaction between the AI and the player. Um, the AI doesn't really know any concept of what a drink is. Right? It's just saying, you know, say sentence one. So it has sentence one and records it and then takes those back and parses those to work out what the person said and then deals with it and then says, you know, say sentence two. And so it's a, it hasn't got concepts that are going with the script, it's just got a pattern that's followed. Goal oriented behavior? Did you guys do any goal oriented behavior? A little bit? Did anyone else do goal oriented behavior? So, we can talk a little bit about goal oriented behavior. You, and you guys can tell me which one of these you want to know more about. Right? So, goal oriented behavior is the idea that I can have a list of actions, right? So, things like um, shoot bow, cast spell, melee attack, charge, run away, wait, patrol, right? So, I've got a bunch of actions that I can take. Now, to pick which action to take, I work out an objective and then try and work back from my objective to what I need to be doing now. Right? So I go, my goal is to kill the player. So I need to choose an action that will damage the player as much as possible. I look through my things and I say, I ca and I say can I cast a spell at the player? And I can't see the player yet. Can I shoot the player? No, I can't see the player yet. Can I immediately? No, I can't see the player yet. Right? So I pick the one that, ah, can't see the player. Oh, this action has move until I can see the player. Right? So I pick from an action that move that says move, so I start moving so I can see the player. As soon as I see the player, I then have another pass through and say, okay, I can see the player, now what do I do? Right? And and I say, can I can are they within range? No, still can't shoot them yet. So I can't pick the actions that are shooting the player. So I have charge as an action, which is which is satisfied by if you can see the player, but they're out of range, and health is high this action can fire. And so you, you go through and you work out your chain of behaviors. Now, if you do this a long way in front, right, you can actually create a whole path. You say, okay, I know that I'm gonna have to hit them and that will take off a bit of health and then I will do it. The, the action before that is hit them, the action before that is cast a spell, the action before that is hit them, the action before that is cast. So you can make a long plan or you can do stimulus response plans where you go, okay, my current goal is to kill the player, but I've got to get to the state where I can shoot them. So you have kind of a, this fall through effect. Um, and there are simple agent behaviors like voids, but um, often those are used for object avoidance or just kind of moving around the space so you don't look too stupid. Um, one of the things that games talk about don't do enough is deal with frustration. Right? It's one of the things you can see when AI get it wrong is that they don't get bored of what they're doing. Right? And that's when they're most obviously not human, is where they, they wander around and they just, like, they bump, they bump into a wall and they keep walking into the wall. Right? Now, humans bump into walls, but they usually get frustrated at some point that they're not achieving anything. Right? And so programming frustration in your AI, so eventually you go, oh, I'm just going to go and do something else. Right? Screw this. This is... Right, and, and, and wandered off. Right? That would be more in, intelligent according to what the player would think. Right? So, so you kind of look at, at implementing simple rules in your AI. Uh, in the city simulation AIs, we, we look at, you know, you have rules saying, I want to spend so much time at work, I need to spend so much time at home, I'm hungry, so I need to go and get food, and I need to buy things, and I need to have entertainment, and you have these just simple scalar values, which are your needs, and then you satisfy them by going somewhere, doing something, right? And you work out which is your highest need at the moment, and you try and satisfy that, right? Which is kind of a scalar needs solution. There are more advanced, the subsumption architecture. Uh, Rodney Books um, wrote about this and then wrote another kind of 15 papers with exactly the same idea in it um, and got them all published somehow. But um, 
it's a simple idea is that you have kind of layers of behavior and your what you you have kind of the the lower the, the higher level behaviors subsume they overtake the lower the, the, the behaviors that are at a lower level in, in the architecture uh, and so if I have a goal of um, you know going to my office part of that is getting out of this room right and while I'm doing the getting out of the room um, if I come too close to an object my collision avoidance system takes over and makes me avoid that. And once I avoid the object, then I fall back to the, oh, what was my plan again? Oh, yes, it was going to the office, right? So I, so when a more important, a more critical thing takes over, I respond to that immediately because it subsumes my previous behavior. And then when I'm done with that, I then go back to doing the, the kind of more general, the, the overview behavior. Um, there are some problems with that. That's not really how humans behave because I don't walk towards the wall go, Oh shit! Okay, I'm safe now. Right, walk towards. Whoa, oh shit! <laughs> and then go. Right, so, so I don't kind of completely forget what I'm trying to achieve just because I was about to run into something. Right? I kind of factor that into my plan. Right? So that's so not not perfect way of simulating humans. Physics-based simulation. Uh, this is really complex. If you want to model. AIs and actually make them physical systems and have neurons and have desires and model the full AI, then yeah, you've got lots to model. And most of the time, they really won't know. Um, I saw like one of the, the lectures I saw, um, and I was sitting in the in the lecture at the back, and I think, yeah, I'm not sure you know what you're talking about. Um, he was talking about AI, and what he's doing is he's saying, ah. We're doing the AI for a lift, okay? So in it for an elevator. So for the AI for an elevator, how much physical-based modeling do you need to do? What limitations should an, should an elevator have? Should be able to go to the sides. Should go sideways. That's probably a good thing. Yes, though there are some elevators that, that can, yeah. Um, generally, it won't because that would be stupid. Um, so yeah, side, you're right, don't go side. Um, it probably takes some time to get from one floor to another. Right, that when you step into the elevator and you're doing an AI simulation in an elevator, right, you step in the elevator, you press the button, and suddenly the doors close and immediately open and you're at the next floor. That wouldn't be a perfectly good physics-based simulation of an elevator, right? And you have to decide, in your game, are your elevators all magically at the floor you're at, right? So you're running around in your shooting game, and you see an elevator, you press the button, and you start seeing the numbers come down. You think, okay, I just have to wait. <laughs> right, and that might not be the best player experience at that point. Unless it's a horror game, you press the button, and the thing's coming, and you're waiting for the lift, and you're gonna shoot, and you're running out of ammo, and so that might be an experience you intend to create. So you have a, but you don't actually need to physically simulate the elevator moving at that point. Because the player can't see it moving. You just have to have the numbers count down and then have it arrive at the scripted time when it's supposed to arrive. So it doesn't have to physically be modeled. What this guy was saying is, um, well, what you do if you're doing an elevator AI is you model the motor and you work out the performance characteristics of the motor in the elevator shaft so that when the elevator starts from another floor, it takes time to accelerate and you model the weight of the accelerator and the cables and you implement all of that so your elevator moves properly to where the player wants it to be. You press in, you go in, you press go, and then it does the, the appropriate movement of kind of, you know, the additional weight of the player and the elevator and the strain on the motor. I mean, and it's an electric motor, which means it has a start curve of how, it, no, no, the player doesn't care. I, I, okay, I as a player don't care. I assume most of you don't care if the elevator in your first person shooter game has the right initiation profile as it starts to move, that it kind of does that wee drag as it, the brakes let go, so that it kind of starts and then creeps up and then starts accelerating appropriately, appropriately slows down? Or are you more worried about shooting the monsters that are coming at you while the door's closing? Um, so, yeah, I, 
Some people go far too much into AI here, and I think they just, they're simulation junkies who know the only way they can get the games is by being an AI. And so they just want to simulate stuff. They don't care about the player experience. Neural networks and Jenny Galvin. I love these two. I really don't get to use them much in games. Right? I mean, they're, they're fun, they're fantastic, they're great, but they're uncontrollable, right? Because they learn stuff like people do, right? They, they kind of, they work the way humans do, and so they, I can't script them, I can't tell them not to do clever things, right? And so you generally only get to use neural networks and AI with buddy AI systems because, you know, they can be cle more clever and that's okay, up to the point where I as a player suddenly realize that if I let all of my sports team play by themselves and don't take over any one of the characters, it will win. If I take over, it loses. <laughs> so uh, the game is far better if I just don't fumble around doing stupid things and making missed passes all the time. Right? So your AI can't be smarter than the player if they're buddy AI, or the player will just go, <laughs> um, And so, you know, they just, like, when you take over, they make your character run faster when, it, when it's player controlled, just to give the player a sense that they're useful in the team. Because if you actually, generally, if you, if you let a player take over one of the AI characters in a sports team, a sports simulation game, right? So football game or rugby game or NFL or, or baseball, they'll generally be worse than your AIs. So you have to give them superpowers that when they take over a player, it now runs at 120% of its normal speed. And it can pass further and kick fast further and, you know, to make the player fe feel special because um, the AIs are better than the player. Um, the other place to use these is in understanding player behavior. Right? So another big part of AI that's starting to be in games now is managing big data. So we get lots of player data, we want to understand the player, and so we use neural networks and we use genetic algorithms to model and understand and evolve solutions that where we help understand why people are playing our game and when they're playing our game and how long they're playing our game and, and kind of understand humans because humans are complex and require sort of this adaptive solution. So um, I was then going to go into specific algorithms. Um, what's my time? I've not put... Three minutes to ten. Three minutes to ten. Okay, so um, we'll go through ones quickly that you already know and I have some coding later to show you some Lua scripting. Have you guys done any Lua scripting? Do you want to learn about Lua scripting? You've heard of Lua? Yes. Okay, who, who has heard of Lua? Yes. Yeah, okay, so you guys, the international... Okay, that's interesting, of course. Uh, Lua is a, an odd little language, um, but it's used as like the interface for World of Warcraft. You can script that in Lua, so it is used in games a reasonable way. Okay, so a couple more minutes of, of AI. So, um, we're seeing A star here. You guys are happy with A star? Heuristics. Um, I'm always a little annoyed by, by the way they write A star, but um, I always thought it should should have like your your function of start, my current position, and my goal should be what the input to the function is, rather than the f of x, because it talks about f of x, and it shouldn't be f of x. It should be f of s comma x comma e. <laughs> it should be the whole thing, and so I know I then calculate start to my current position which is already traveled path, and my current position to end, which is my heuristic path. That information should be passed into the function. Um, and I shouldn't write it like h of b equals 2. No, that's stupid. It should be h of start, comma b, comma end is 2. Because that actually gives me enough information to know what one I'm talking about, know where I'm going from and going to, and all those things. Right? So I, I find the, the mathematicians aren't programmers, and so they don't understand how to write <coughs> functions properly, right? So um, they think, well, you know, it was assumed that that was the start and the end, so we already got that in globals. And you're not good programmers, you don't put those in globals, you pass them into the function. Right? So, so unfortunately, sometimes when you're reading maths, you have to realize that they're not programmers, and they don't understand the problems with global scope, and so they, they, pr they program very badly. And if you've ever read physicist code, it's really awful because they use one letter variable, like one letter function name. This is a one letter function name. Don't ever do that to me. That's ridiculous. 
right? This shouldn't be a one meter function now. But yeah, so but mathematicians and physicists like that kind of thing. So uh, as you say, find paths. Um, a few things. Um, what there, like sometimes A star can can give you some some interesting results. So um, when I'm sure you've played um, strategy games where I take a unit and I say go attack the foreign base that's in the darkness out there, right? So I go and say, you're standing here, I know the base is probably over there, go and explore over there, right? So I take a scout and I press into the blackness and he starts running that way. And I think, that bastard knows more about the world than I do. Right, because he knows that there's gap in the mountain range over there. <laughs> um, and that's the fastest way to get to that point I clicked on. Right, right and that's that's because, you know, this is unrealistic. He, he shouldn't really know more. And why can't I just ask him, okay, so you know how to get through this map. Can you just show me the map, please? Um, surely that would happen. Um, I, did, I did get this in a UI fail um, with, one, with um, one of the Lord of the Rings real-time strategy games. Um, I went to build a building, right? And, um, and I'm not sure how I found this. I can't remember exactly the process. But what I found is that you know, when, when you went to build something, it would highlight so in red when you couldn't build, right? And green when you could. You're all used to that metaphor build. Um, and you know, when you went over your own building, it would show you the corner in red that you were overlapping with your own building. So it said you couldn't build there. Right? Made sense, right? Because move it slightly and I can build. If you took that tool and ran it over in the fog of war area over to the other person's base, it would show you in red where all their buildings were by telling you, no, you can't build there because there's already a building there. So I just map out my enemy's base using my full build tool in Fog of War because the build tool knew what was in there because it had to know so it would tell me that I couldn't build it. Right? Now, you know, that's... And, you know, when I went over mountains, it would also show me, oh, you can't build here, there's too much terrain. And then when there was no, no thing blocking me, it would just show you red because I didn't know enough to build there. <laughs> so, but the way it fell back through the, if there's a building, show a building, if there's a mountain, show a mountain, if there's a tree, show a tree, if there's nothing, check to see if they're allowed to build there. Right? So it was, the fall through was wrong, but it meant that I could explore Fog of War using my tools. Um, did any of you try that? In no, I don't know exactly sure how I worked this out, but I did. I kind of went, oh, hey, wow, okay, this is neat. Um, so yeah, it, it does give you a bit of an advantage because you can go and see what your enemy's building. Because well, you can work out from the size of the uh, objects they're building, what kind of things they're building and where they're building. Right? <laughs> you would think that well, that that's because the UI designer yeah. wasn't the game designer. <laughs> Right? And didn't understand that fog of war means you shouldn't do that. But I'm sure you've all had the experience of your units running off in the yeah. odd direction because they know more about the world than you do, right? And A star is not how humans operate. Usually what we do is when we see a goal, we start propelling our bodies towards that goal and then adjust as we get closer. Right? We don't do a pause thing, okay, that's the shortest path, so I'll, I'll see and go that way. Right? You see this often when you look at... at, at um, paths that people are taking to and from um, going across crossings and things, right? They'll turn and they'll point at the place they need to get to, they'll walk there, and then they'll have to go round a thing that's on the ground. Because they won't have planned, oh, it's actually shorter if I start heading this way. Because then they break, no, no, I go to where I'm going, and when I'm getting close, that's when I'll do an adjustment. Right? So often you'll see a path that comes, that you've got an obstacle, it comes, you know you're trying to get there, it comes here, and then it goes around the obstacle rather than just going straight to the edge of the obstacle, isn't it? Because right? people just don't naturally know shortest path. Eventually some of them will work it out. Um, it can also be very slow if you're having to do this calculation for every single unit, every single step, and every single time, and anything changes, you have to recalculate. And so yeah, so um, there are some ways of, of dealing with it. Um, with these changes in deformation, um, sometimes they'll have lead units and follow units. So if you have a group of 20 people, one of them does A star, and then everybody just takes the offset of where that guy is. And if that guy gets killed, it falls on the next one to do the A star navigation, and everybody else is just 
coordinating with that guy. Right? So we move to the troop, one guy knows where we're going. Right? So you can do some ways of trying to make it a bit faster, but it's still unrealistic. Okay, so um, you also need a whole bunch of stuff um, on the A star, so you need to have a concept of a path. With open spaces, it can be quite tricky, so you have to actually build machinery around in your world to break large open spaces, or large spaces with some obstacles, into navigable areas. Um, you can also look at, at having guests, guesses at best paths. You can also do the, like, you know, what's the fastest way to Trondheim? Well, the fastest way to Trondheim is not for me to start turning and walking towards the wall. <laughs> right? Because if I just did the naive, I want to get closer to Trondheim, I could turn, I could start getting closer to Trondheim. Right? That's not a good move. So here, I could at least work out that going to the door and then going outside might then get me to a place where I could start walking towards Trondheim. But walking to a tram, I'm still not going to be the fastest path, right? So I need to find a car. But my car is in the other direction of Trondheim. So I have to start searching out in my plan to find a place where I can get a vehicle that will be faster. And then I have to decide when I'm in my vehicle, do I drive to Oslo and fly, or do I drive directly to Trondheim? And so my path finding has to expand out. But if I didn't know where the airports were, I'd have to think in all directions to find out where these magical teleporters that can fly me at 100 kilometers an hour to get to tel Trondheim are. So what I do is I actually step at a higher level and say, well, there are only a couple of airports in the country that allow me to do that, so let's just find out how long it takes me to get from here to that special location. Right, so I do hierarchical ASTA. Right, so there's a whole bunch of stuff we can talk about there. Um, one of the interesting uses of ASTA and I'll do this and then let you guys have a break, um, is the idea of, of using an abstract path. Rather than thinking of this physical path, what you do is you create all your behaviours as a graph of you know, all the actions and the transitions between states are the actions you can take that move you through a graph. Once you've mapped out your actions and your states, you then do an A star with cost of what is the best action to take. Right? Because I'm not moving through space, but I'm moving through sort of concept space of potential actions. And each of those actions have a unit cost, and so I can work out what is the most efficient way of using up my resources. Right? So rather than thinking of ASAP merely as a tactile ground thing, you can use it for paths. Um, and actually, oh, this is the last one. The last one, did you guys do um, map? functions and um, discrete cost functions when you did A-star? So, sort of. Sort of. So when you, cause you know how you have like A-star has arcs and arcs have costs, right? Mm -hmm. And you use those costs to work out how to go from here to here. Well, you can also, if you're doing something on a map, you can also use heat maps and map information to say, well, okay, these are trees. There are trees between this node and that node, so it's going to cost more. Right? Now, one of the things you can also do is say, well, okay, the tree map is for tanks, but not for infantry. Right? So the tanks have to add the tree cost because it's much lower for them to bash them down, where infantry doesn't have to use the tree cost because they can walk through it. Right? So different units can have different cost maps. You can also use dynamic maps, uh, and you do see this with simple A star, where if I'm at, uh, going across a bridge, whenever one of the NPCs gets shot on the bridge, it marks the bridge as being less safe. And so it increases the cost of walking across the bridge. And eventually the A star, having calculated cost, will go, oh look, that cost has gone up now, I'll map around and go another route. Right, so what you do is you're sitting there shooting the, the, the NPCs that they can run, run across the bridge, and after you've shot five or six of them, that's created enough cost there that the, the AI is now clever enough to start going somewhere else to try and get you. They're not clever. You've just added a map of saying, well, that now costs more. And then what you do is create berserk units who ignore the blood splatter cost and will charge across the bridge regardless. And now you've got two types of AI. You've got normal infantry and berserk infantry. 
but you haven't, you've just got a star whether they care about the blood map or not. And then you know you can have the blood map will slowly decay over time. So you add one to it and you minus like 0.1 each time. So after you've killed six of them, there's six. And then you know, if, like, a second later it's 5.9, 5.8. So they, uh, they, they run across the bridge until too many of them are killed, then they start going somewhere else, then after a while one of them will try again, you shoot him, and no one else will try for a while. Right? But if you leave it, they'll start running across that bridge again. Right? So it seems like they've got like, deep understanding of the world. And it's not, they're just using a heat map, a cost map, with a standard A star. And you can do that with all sorts of things. Right? You can say, okay, infantry will worry about being shot, but tanks won't. So the infantry will hold back until the tank goes across. Right? So you shoot the infantry men, they hang back, the tank drives across as they allow it to come across, and then it attacks you. Because the thing's been decreasing, you know, when a tank goes across, maybe you wipe out the blood cost. So the tank clears the path for everybody, and then they come rushing across again. Right? So it seems like really intelligent, but it's just a couple of numbers on the map. Right? It's still just standard A star. It's just you've affected cost in an interesting way. Okay, so we'll do that, and then we'll go and we'll talk about scripts. You guys have a 10-minute break. Stand up, walk around. The stream can wait for me to come back. Back in 10. 10? <coughs> okay. I could go to YouTube and try and fix it. Then I, I, I can set it up. Right, I should set up. Though while I'm uh, while I'm paused, I should set up.
in bad detail. Yes, you're right. We should have a picture of a kind of you know that it has a secondary screen, which when it pauses, it shows us behind, which is you know us all smiling knowingly at you. Oh no, no. you paragliding, me building a trebuchet, and Chris scuba diving or something. Um, um, so perform. Yes, sprite sheets are much faster. Um, so Generally, yes, uh, but we don't know if you need that speed. Right? So you can decide not to waste the time until you know that you've got a problem. Or you can say, well, we're going to use, I know we're going to use sprite sheets, we're going to get lots of sprites. So we'll do the sprite sheet class now. Right? And just get used to the idea of using sprite sheets. So, yeah. Yeah. Right, we usually have those way back in October. Oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, 
But we can have a meeting about that earlier if you want to. Yeah, because we want to do the thesis during the year because we don't have too much work. Okay. Yeah. Yep. So we can. I like to have uh, information like as soon as possible because I don't know if they're going to validate that the thesis that we get running. This has to be, it has to be related to my <laughs> my bachelor, that is the communications engineering. <laughs> so uh, I'm wondering between uh, databases thesis or get running thesis. And you said the information I have to send them to my tutor in Spain and he has to say, right. okay, okay. So we need yeah. to do that as soon as possible. Right. Yeah, if it's possible. Yeah, I, I understand the challenge. Um, so, uh, but I'll, I'll try and get this sorted. Um, we can. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah, the chat does go on. Um, yeah, but I'll, we'll try and get it. Um, okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Right, 
So, actually, guys, okay, so we'll. I'll, I'll, I'll get my screen back. And. That. Woohoo! Right. Okay, guys. Um, uh, we're, I'm just going to do some setup for code, um, and part of the reason to do this is um, your. If you're using SDL, you guys know setting up libraries and stuff. So this is obviously giving a problem that I need SDL image.h and it cannot find SDL image.h. And so I go to project and I, well, actually, um, yes, project, the project configuration properties and under C++, I go to the general and I've got a terrible include path there. Yes. Hello, um, stream. Uh, and then I have to um, edit. And I'm so you can see here. Uh, one of the things that I do, um, and I can point over there, um, is that I use uh, SDL underscore home and Lua home because I like using. Generally, what I try and do is use the include uh, an include path string rather than my string on my computer, which means in the environment variables you have to set up those um, environment variables. Okay, which means if you use some about some of my code, I'll try and tell you what all these environment variables you have to, have to set up are. But it's SEL home is the root directory of SEL, which should have included it, and the Lua home there is the root directory where you installed Lua, or download and, and put Lua in. Um, so, so here I need to. Add a new one, which is the SDL image. And seeing I've got SDL image in probably in D drive under libs there, and SDL image, and go. Um, and I'm looking for the include file, so I have to include include. I select folder, and go OK, and go apply. Okay. One trick is when you do set environment variables, um, your system will um, need like so. Internet, so uh, Visual Studio needs to be closed down and restarted to know that you've updated the environment variables windows. So if you go and change environment variables in Windows, you have to shut down Visual Studio, restart Visual Studio, so it can recognize those changes. Right? Otherwise, it'll be very frustrating. It's a simple gotcha. But it's got me several times, and it's very annoying. Okay, so now that I've added, um, I've added image, this is so this is just a straight. I was doing some hacky code. This is terribly, terribly hacky code. I've made it a tiny bit better in the 360 um, uh, project, but the problem with it now it's the linking folder. Cannot find. Um, cannot open file SDL to image lib. So. I've added a, a, a library, so what I need to do is I need to go to here. Oh. Okay. Why is it not showing me my. Well, right, okay. So um, I say, well, okay, the lib's not where the lib should be. So in the linker, I need to go to project and go to properties and go into the linker tool and say, okay, well, you need SDL image lib. So um, um, the reason I'm having to do this live is because I updated it on my machine at home, and my machine at home has a newer version of Visual Studio. And so this version of Visual Studio doesn't understand the later version of Visual Studio project files. Have you guys had that problem? Yeah, OK. Um, so we do this with the additional directory, and here I go. So this is for a library. So I have to go and find the Visual Studio lib. Normally, I would use an. I do it with a SDL image, but here if I go again to D drive and I go libs, it's useful to put all your libraries in one place. As you can see, I have quite a lot of them. Um, here under lib, and it's the x86 is the version I'm using. Select folder, go OK, go apply, and go OK, and then go play. Right, so I added the .h file, and then I added the code lib file, and now it will clearly, yes, it cannot find the Lua lib file. 
So, I had to go back, and that's why I had to go back. But um, if I go to the Lua lib file, I can go in here and go there and go edit and uh, new. Now what I've done is I had actually updated the code to um, okay. where's the Lua Lib 5.1? So um, I had it updated to 5.3, um, which doesn't make many changes, but does have a few changes that are relevant uh, in the code file. So um, if you go and have a look at the um, 360 repository, you'll find that I've actually have got the right files in there um, if you are installing new. So there's Lua Lib 5.3, which is the new Lua, and it's looking for 5.1. So there's 5.3. Okay, I need to find 5.1 Lua Lib. You bastard. Um, Okay, let's go, and this is, is, is a little annoying, um, so go cancel. What I can try is to say that actually I'm going to go into my libraries, and you see in here where it says which libraries I'm supposed to use, um, it's looking for um, Here is path. Where is the ah, inputs? It's in the hood. Let's try changing that to five three. How bad is this going to be? At least now I can. Edit so I go to projects <sighs> and, and path and edit. Add so this was yeah caused by me getting my, my versioning wrong earlier. Um, Interestingly, I had a, 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 um, a student when I was working in first year um, who uh, was having having problems, and, and you know uh, um, went up to them and, and said, "Okay, um, I you you're not getting this assignment done. Uh, what's the problem?" And he said, "Well, you know, I'm I'm uh, I'm getting getting this error." And I said, "Okay, well, what's the error said? You know, missing semicolon." I said, "Okay, well, why didn't you put it in?" I, said, I put it in, and then I got more errors. So, so, yes, the model of how close you are to a solution is independent of how many errors you have. Um, I'll get back to that. Um, maybe you guys can try. Do you have a Windows PC? He does. I don't have Visual Studio. You don't have Visual Studio? Oh, I'm so, yeah, I'm not happy to. Okay. <laughs> One of you can pull the, the 360 repo and see if you can get, get it going. And then I can show your code. Anyway, I'll go on. The code we can show at the end, um, I can try and get it working. Right. So. Scripts, AI techniques for scripting, um, the, the idea of, of having a, a, a script, as I said, the way to script, the cyber sequence of behaviors, and then with those behaviors, make a, a kind of choice in a linear script. Uh, if you've had a look at interactive fiction, have you done any inform interactive fiction? So um, there is a language called inform, uh, which you can, Use so if we look here and go inform seven, 
Um, this is a text-based adventure game writing system, which is basically a massive scripting system. Right? Except this tries to write in standard English and turn that into code. Right? And so when you when you start the new project, um, so start a new project, and we call it. Um, When I start a new project, um, I can actually have a look in here, and it, it says, you know, it does the introduction, and if I have a look at the next page, which is uh, example, so the source text, um, if I make that bigger. Okay, so uh, how this works is um, you write in English, and it interprets it as code. So it says, the wood slated crate is in the gazebo. The crate is a container. Right? And so it now has the wood slated is a um, adjective on this crate, which is the, the noun, so that's an object. And it has is in a location, and this is an object. Right? And so you can say, Mr. Jones wears a top hat. The cake, the, the crate contains a croquet mallet. So you write all of you write your code as English words and statements, and then it tries to compile them and extract information from them. You have to write in a very strict way, and it starts feeling like you're kind of writing very very strange English after a while. Um, so when you want to talk about things, you start having phrases. Uh, the debris room is west of the crawl. You are in the debris filled room with stuff washed inside of the that, so it has like a string that appears. The black rod is here. A three foot black rod. So the black rod is here and then you have the string that appears when you see the black rod. Right? So you kind of write your description. So it has it, and you build up a script of what's happening uh, and descriptions and text. And as you can see here it says above the debris room is the uh, sloping east west canyon. West of the canyon of the canyon is the Orange River chamber. So you kind of describe the relationships in English, and it tries to interpret them. Um, it gets very strange when you start getting near the end, um, and you kind of you know activities. Um, so before printing the name of the woman, say Ms. So you have to start describing. An action is a simulated task for the fictional protagonist. An activity is a real task for the computer program doing the simulation. So you have to kind of describe in English your code. Very strange, but it's a, a, a basically a tool for writing text-based adventure games. Um, it's similar to interacting with smart home devices nowadays. Yes, right? it's like interacting with a smart home device. Well, you know, when you say, Siri, tell me the temperature, or um, yeah, Google now, or yeah, okay, Google, yeah. tell me a joke, and it says, Sorry, I can't help you with a joke. Or if you're doing this in the car while well, you're navigating, because. <laughs> okay, so someone's first phone, I think my phone, heard me say, okay, Google, and just told me a joke. Okay, yes, it did. This might make you laugh. Why can't a bicycle stand on its own? It's too tired. <laughs> Okay, so, um, thank you. <laughs> okay, Google. Um, <laughs> okay, Google, give my lecture. Okay, it's not the thing anymore. Oh, that, that, that. So that's humorous, but strange. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, you get this kind of odd phrasing where you start up the script and you have to describe it in certain ways and you have to speak in certain ways to get things to interact, right? And so writing in natural language feels that way. Um, Emergent behaviours, you guys did voids, you guys don't know what voids is. You guys in the back? Did I do the international? Did you ever have voids? Nope. So voids are three simple rules. When you combine the rules of trying to align with everyone else and everyone else is doing, which means I would stand like this and sit down a little bit. Um, I'd also want to try and get to the centre of everybody, which means I would be trying to kind of be here-ish. Um, but also I have a rule of not being too close to people, so I can't kind of stand here, because that would be wrong, and you'd be uncomfortable. 
Um, so, so yeah, so I have some simple rules, and from those rules it generates what looks like complex behavior, right? So um, that's, and boys are relatively simple. If, if you, uh, you guys all understand that. Yep, that's good. Internationals, if you want to learn more, you can come and chat. Cheating. How much cheating should your AI do? As much as needed. Um, how do you know when you might want to stop cheating? <laughs> Partly when it wins. What might another indication be that your AI is cheating too much? When the player notices. When the player tells you, the AI is cheating and I hate it. Does it matter whether you're actually cheating or not when the player says that? No. Um, and this is, and, and I'm going to sound a bit strange here, but this is a bit like when you're in a relationship, right? And your girlfriend or boyfriend says, um, you know, you always do this, right? It doesn't matter if they're technically right or not. <laughs> you know, you remember the one time when you didn't do it and you say, well, no, no, I don't always do it. You know, four weeks ago, I didn't do it. I remember that. <laughs> Okay, I didn't mean always, I mean most of the time you do it. <laughs> so, no, they're not actually trying to be technically correct about what's going on, they're upset, right? And so you might have to do something about that, even if the player isn't technically correct about your game cheating, you still might have to change your game to make your player happy, right? In the same way you might have to change your behavior to make your partner happy, even if they're not necessarily perfectly correct about what they've said, right? So yes, as you can tell, this does come from some personal experience. Um, okay, so when you've cheated too much, um, you yeah, the player will notice. You can get around some interesting things like like harder enemies. Uh, if you instead of making your AI harder, you just give it more health, and players will think, oh, oh, it's healthier, right? Oh, they, well, sorry, they won't think it's healthier. They'll think it's more intelligent. They think. They won't go, oh, it just took me longer to kill. So it must, they must have added health to it. They'll think, oh, it was better at avoiding my bullets, or it was cleverer, just because it lasted longer. Um, you can also, randomness, right? In that same way that, you know, how much you should cheat depends on the person. Sometimes if your AI just does random things, your players will create a narrative around the random decisions it took. Things like, I bought an umbrella today, and that's why it didn't rain. Right? That's ridiculous. <laughs> or massively egotistical, right? Somehow, my individual choices affect the weather for an entire country. Right? That's kind of, really? I have that much power in my umbrella? Um, but players will make stories about random stuff that happens, right? Including, you know, oh, lightning and thunder. That's scary. There must be a god who is angry at us, who is yelling at us and making noise and terrifying us and using that to yes, make us afraid. So they'll make stories about reality. Even if it's just random, they'll create some narrative around it. Right? So, so you can use that to your advantage as an AI developer where you just throw some randomness in there and the player makes the story for you. Right? Um, <coughs> make the environment more intelligent. So when I was talking about A star and you make like, the blood trail, actually that's what ants do, right? So what ants do is they make the world intelligent rather than themselves intelligent. So they keep their brain is, is really, really tiny. So what you do as an ant is that when you come out of the um, of your, your hole, of your um, of your you know, out, out nest, um, you go looking for food. And you leave a scent trail saying I'm hungry, looking for food. Right? So you just wander off. And you don't remember where your home is. You just have, like, scent on the ground. Right? You've got a vague navigation, but not really very good. So you've got the scent on the ground. You just leave it around. And then you find some food. You go, oh, oh, food. Great. I picked that up. And now I go to that. How do I get home? Where did hungry ants come from? Oh, oh, there's a hungry ant trail. I'll follow that hungry ant trail and I'll find my way back to hungry ants. So I followed that back. But while I'm carrying food, because I touched it with my mandibles, I mean, ooh, yummy, sweet. That sugar changed my pheromones and now I need a, ooh, I've got food trail behind me. 
So I leave the I've got food trail while I follow the hungry ant trail until I get back to my nest. And then I give the food over and go, oh, I'm a hungry ant. And then I step out and go, oh, I want the food. Oh, oh, there's some smell of someone who had some food. I'll go and find that. Um, and so I wander off to where I found food. And they get the food and go, oh, hungry ant. Right. Oh, there's the hungry ant trail. <laughs> so they're not intelligent, but they've made the world intelligent for them. Right? Um, and so as an AI developer, instead of always thinking I need to have an intelligent AI, you might say, no, no, I can keep my AI simple. If I make the world around it more intelligent, that's where I'll put cunning. Um, there's a, a wasp, the paper wasp. When it brings food back for its grub, right? It comes back with the grub, with the food. It goes into the nest. Uh, it, it puts the food down at the, the start of its nest. It goes in, it cleans the larva, it comes out, it picks up the food, gives it to the larva, comes out and flies away, looking for more food. Right, so that's, that's what it does. But it's a stimulus response AI. It uses the fact that it puts the food down to remember there's food there. So what, they did, what the researcher does, and this is, researchers are really mean at this, right, is the, the, the wasp comes in, it's put down its food, it then goes in, cleans the lava, and while it's back turned, the researcher picks up the grub and moves it 10 centimeters. The wasp comes out and goes flying looking for food. Grabs the food it finds, comes back, puts it down, goes in, cleans the lava, comes out, oh, no food, right, going off the food. Um, and it will just keep doing that perpetually. And it, it doesn't just grab the food and then immediately go in thinking, you know, I've got to get in there because I keep the food behind and keeps disappearing. It never gets frustrated, it never knows, it doesn't have memory that it had food and that it had to do that because that's not the instinct it has. And so it doesn't, can, or, and it doesn't remember, oh, I've already cleaned the grub. I don't need to clean it again because it doesn't remember cleaning it because that's not, it doesn't have a memory of events. It just has a stimulus response. Right? And so what we think of as memory in these systems, what we think of as learning or adaption or, or that kind of experience, sometimes are just their environment doing it for them. Right? And we do this with humans as well, right? We try and encode more in our environment. IKEA has the big arrows on the floor to try and remind you how to walk forward. Because <laughs> um, <laughs> you're in the IKEA days of so many things to buy and I don't want any of it. Um, so yeah, it's, it, we make our environment intelligent. We make our phones intelligent. We, it, we outsource intelligence to the environment. Um, so simple simulation response, AI, but complex environment. And fake processes, right? Like complex processes like line of sight. Um, if the player wants to be in cover, just make them in cover. So instead of actually calculating AI's line of sight to you, what I do is say, did you crouch by something that offers cover? If you crouch by something that offers cover, let's just assume it worked. Even if I can actually still see your head because it pokes out because you're wearing a stupid hat because you bought it on the store um, and now it pokes out above the, the top of the, 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 the cover area you're in. Um, as an AI, I'll just ignore that because you know, that's not part of the gameplay was your stupid hat. So um, rather than using line of sight and doing complex calculations, I just say, is the player in cover? Yes, okay, I want you to win. Okay? So sometimes faking those complex processes is the best way of doing it. Um, Killzone did uh, some interesting stuff on their AI, um, and people gave it like quite rave reviews. So if you imagine that was a threat here, and I'm starting from running from here to here, um, this path would be my A star path, but it would be a bad path because I'd get shot by the, the threat by the enemy. So what I actually do is I have a line of sight projection, and how I do this is I take a ray projection from the threat to the edge of this area and down here, and to the edge of this area and down here, away from the threat. And then I kind of map that. And then I do A star. So now this is going to be faster than running all the way here until it's low threat and running all the way back. Right? So, but if I'm, a, if I'm heavily damaged, I might decide to run all the way out of shot and then come all the way back. Right? But a normal unit will just skip across the back of the cover because this now has lower total weight than going in front of the cover. 
right? So, so they actually did cover-based movement just by doing a couple of ray tracing, making the edge uh, map transitions more expensive to go through cover, and then you get that clever behavior. Right? And the player thinks, wow, it's really good at using cover to get from one point to another. Right? And it's actually a relatively simple system. In fact, they do it even simpler. They do some optimizations on, on only calculating in eight directions. So they actually do this in, let's look at everything going in that direction, then everything going down, then everything going in this direction, and they just do it in, in large chunks rather than um, very fine detail. How smart? Right, so simple thing. Tracking the player's velocity, less, as I said, Batman, yeah, don't get that it gets um, Mr. Freeze to track the player's location. It's too good. Um, players will assume that you're cheating. So if they start complaining, just give that to them. All right, so, um, and invisible player, it, and going back to the, that invisibility, if the player doesn't see it happen, it didn't happen. Right? So there's a kind of rule in games. If the player doesn't notice it, it never happened. Which means whatever AI clever thing you do in the background, if the player doesn't see that it did that AI, it never happened. It doesn't care. Right? So you wasted a whole bunch of development time doing something the player never notices. So you have to think of your AI as being visible. Which is why at the GDC and at game developers conferences, often AI is put under the, the animation group. Right? It's not part of the physics update, it's not part of the world simulation, it's part of animation. Because the only thing that is useful about AI is it changes what the player sees. Right? We don't care about the back end, the back end will deal with itself, it's a simulation, it's not AI, it's just code. AI is about making the player see something different happen. Right? Now, I don't necessarily agree with that, I think you can use AI all through your system, but that's the the core in, in, in AI in, in the industry is it has to be visible. Um, so the player must be aware of your AI. You exaggerate things. So as I said, if you've got Mr. Freeze, you've got to go, hey, I've seen you running. I'm now going to shoot you. So that's an exaggeration. Right? Um, if you're in Halo, you've got the exaggeration little guy running away going, ah, to make it entirely obvious that something's happened. Right? So you don't want the player ever to wonder, kind of, I, I don't know what happened here, right? You've got to be explicit about it. Um, reward the player for outthinking your AI, which means you have to make your AI outthinkable. And you should reward the player by giving them something or, or allowing them to do something if they've been clever enough to work out how to get around your AI, that should be some they, they have a technique they've learned, some skill they now have that they've worked out, oh, if, if I wait until he hit, the AI hits the ground, I can then come around and hit him in the head. You probably, yep? Yeah? Is that like, if, if for instance, an enemy can't jump, you just stand on and shoot him? Yes, yes. And, you know, the player feels clever because, you know, it, they worked out, ha ha, it can't jump. I worked that out, and so I can stand on and shoot him, right? Um, if you punish the player for doing that, right, so they, they, they've worked out it can't jump, they've found the ledge, they're standing on the ledge, they're shooting it, and then you like have a big axe come in and swing into the ledge and kill them. Because you <laughs> bastard, you found out how to defeat my AI, I'm gonna kill you for doing that. Um, yeah, that's that's not rewarding your player for outthinking your AI, right? Um, so even though it feels a bit, ah, oh, you found it out, oh well, that's good, because you know, you're having a great experience having defeated my AI. You might make another AI, in the next level that can jump and then they can't use that tactic against the more clever AI. But it's not really more clever, it's you made the first one even dumber than you could have. Just so they could outthink that one. And then once they learned a the technique and outthink that AI, you change your AI to make it a little bit harder to outthink. Right? And then it's a, 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 an increased challenge and therefore I get more reward and so I feel a better game. Right? Um, so that's where I'm talking about balancing stupidity. Uh, you have to add stupidity to your AIs and decide how, much, how stupid your player is and therefore how stupid your AIs have to be. Yeah. Um, if, if your goal is to beat the player, that's usually pretty easy. 
and you probably won't have many people play your game because they'll always lose and there won't be any fun. Um, so, uh, Lua, which I was trying to get running there, and I'll show you some Lua calls and I will get it working. I can defeat it. Fingers crossed. Um, so, 70% of games um, say that they use Lua, right? So we looked at Game AI and 70% of, of the survey industry said they're using Lua. Um, Angry Birds is mostly in Lua. Um, there's Flame Malware in Lua. World of Warcraft is in Lua. Um, and, and, and the user interface is in Lua. The game engine is in, in um, C and C++, but the, you can script your interface. Um, now, so you guys have heard of Lua, but do you have any idea how it works? It's a scripting language. What does that mean? Uh, that's a good question. That's a good question. Okay, so, um, so Lua is its own programming language, right? So it's a programming language. It's a scripting language, which means we've tried to make it a bit easier and not require so much memory management and infrastructure and clever speed and passing. So it's a simplified language. Um, and what it does is it uses a stack-based interface system, right? So when, it, when I want to talk to C++ or talk to Pascal or talk to Java or talk to Go, what I do is I create a standardized way of communicating. And the simplest of this was I create a stack, I push in variables onto the stack, and the number of parameters I'm passing to you as a function are the number of items on the stack. And the thing I want to run is the first thing, so the, the first thing on the stack, and then I put in the variables. Right? So, um, so I pass variables as a stack, and when you give me responses back, I get them as a stack, and I unpack that stack. Right? So I have a, a, a stack machine, which I push things onto, and then when I get things back, I pop them off. Okay. So in C++, we have... Um, you, you have bindings where I can bind my language with and communicate with other languages. So in C++, there's a do Lua file call, which will load a Lua file. And Lua functions, um, uh, and so Lua function, Lua can also call functions out of C++, but you have to tell Lua what are the available functions at that, that it can see, right? Because it doesn't, compile your code and work out what all the function calls are, what you do is you expose certain functions to Lua and say, ah, here are a bunch of functions and here are the number of premises they take. And this is what they return. Message for you, sir. Um, and, in Lua, and, and so in C++, you tell Lua about your functions. And Lua exposes its functions to C++. Its functions to C++. So um, if we actually look at some code, um, here you have, um, I am using a C binding here, so I have, these are Lua states, I create a Lua state, and uh, here I do a Lua open, and I, do a, uh, I take that Lua state, and I open base, and I open this, and I do the do file my Lua, and this loads the Lua file, right? So that, that would be a simple thing which would start running whatever is happening in my Lua file. Right, so that would be a simple way of doing C to load and run a Lua file. Now Lua files are interpreted, which means that if you change it, after you change this executable, when I rerun this executable, or in fact rerun this line of load the Lua file, it will rerun the Lua file. Right, so it will reload it and reinterpret it. Um, what that allows you to do is that if we go to, into actual code, let's have a look, I'll see if I can show you what it's doing. Um, unfortunately, I'm having problems compiling it, but this is an example of, of Lua, and I need to make it zoomed. Where's my scale? There it is. Ah, turn the, I'm over here now. Um, okay, so this is a, a very simple Lua file where I have find nearest bad guy, and this is find nearest bad guy is a function in C++, uh, and find enemy and get to bad guy. Um, these are uh, functions that we've got. Update enemy is a function I have in Lua called update enemy, which passes x, y. 
and I have say hi, which is Simon is running this. Okay, so that's so that's how I write a Lua file, right? So there's no big intro stuff. I've not got lots of loops. I can use for loops. I can use function calls, but the syntax is relatively simple. Um, and if I have a look in my CPP and take that thing as well. Okay, so so here is me registering a function. Now um, this is Lua register. Oh, I can, I'll say here. Um, this is Lua Lua register. So this is registering a C plus plus function. I tell Lua what it should call that function. Right. So it should call it find nearest bad guy, and I will call the function closest enemy. Right. So that's so when Lua calls that function and see this function gets executed. Um, I also have a Lua state. Um, it knows it as hello. I know it as the function color. Okay. So here is uh, I load the Lua state, and um, I can report errors. And here, get Lua get global Lua state enemy x. Now, if you have a look in the Lua file, enemy x equals fifty. Right. So the standard way of doing a configuration file is you just write a bunch of name equals blah, name equals blah, name equals blah, and then in C plus plus. I can just go Lua get global L state enemy X. Can you kill the window with the errors? Oh, can I kill the window with all the errors? Yes. Um, 14 unresolved symbols. That's from, it seems to be Lua strings and main. Yeah, I've got to kill it. Yeah. Oh, I'll just kill it. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I'll do it that way. Okay, so here you can see I get state X. Set up or the setup position x equals lua two number l state minus one, and then I do a lua pop one. Um, this is because I'm working on a stack, and here I've I'm operating through the stack and I'm popping off values in the stack, right? So I'm able to to look at the position in the Lua state, when I go get global, I push that on to the Lua state, called enemy x, and then I set the value on the top of the stack, and the top of the stack is minus one, and then I pop it off. Right? So it seems a bit odd, but what I'm, what I'm doing is I'm grabbing, I'm telling Lua to do something, create a variable that's gonna pass me a result with one entry in it, and then I'm using that one entry and popping it off. Right? So I could do a bunch of operations in Lua and then pop off a bunch of results if I was wanting to do that. Um, in this code, um, I have standard SDL quit things. I have this feature. You guys would have seen the SDL key space or SDL key. Here, when I hit space, I actually reload my Lua state, which means I can be running my program. When I hit space, it will reload the AI. And it'll reload all the functions. If I change any positions, I change any configuration, it could then reload that configuration. Right? And that can be quite useful for testing because you write your executable, and then if I want to change some things, I don't have to edit numbers in the file and then recompile my program. I just edit things in the Lua configuration, press like reset, and it reloads the configuration file and does the update for me. Right, so I'm able to script configurations and reload configurations at runtime from the Lua file. If I set that up with Lua functions, I could actually change what my functions are doing in Lua by reloading the file. Because when you reload the file, it reinterprets all the function names and reassociates all of those. So I can re so I can change, for example, what this Lua function here is doing. I could change that to 200, press space, reload it and now that function does a different job. So I can change the function of my um, executable, my function of my code, by just changing my Lua script and reinterpreting it. All right, so it gives you that configurable options where you're trying, trying different things where you don't have to, 
You don't want to recompile your whole executable, particularly if you're getting massive files or you're starting a big executable. You don't want to keep poking away. And you can save configuration files. You save that away, and you have a different configuration file. And so you can have diff you can try different configurations without having to kind of constantly remember those in code and change the variables in code and do all of that in code. You can just have configurations. You could have press one, it loads level one Lua file. Press two, it loads level two Lua file. So I can instantly flip between levels by flipping between the Lua configurations. All right? And so there's lots of those sort of things you can do which are really nice because when you're updating and testing, you can all have the same executable and just be changing a Lua script. Right? So you don't have that whole rebuild, recompile, it's just a text file that's changing. And that text file can be easily versioned and all those sort of things. Right? Um, now, in here, that shows you how I've, I, so here, um, where I call a Lua function, I'll see if I can find where I call the Lua function. Um, so, yeah, so in the AI update, uh, this is the weird Lua P call that you do. So um, this looks a bit odd, but you'll get used to the syntax. Um, basically what happens is I get global, I can get that, and then I can push two numbers, right? So push the functions and the arguments. So I push the update enemy. So if we have a look in, the, in, in Lua, I have update enemy. So I push the name of the function I'm going to call. I then push the first parameter, and I push the second parameter. And then I tell Lua to do an executable call, a P call, right? an executable call. And I say, you lose the Lua stack, which I've just done, takes two arguments and two results. So it gets a pair back. Um, and error is what you do, I think, if you can't find it, there's an error function. And this is equal zero if it doesn't return anything, right? So, but here I then do if not is number. So if the first thing returned is a number, I say, oh, I got some kind of error. Otherwise, I can take the top number in the stack, I can then take, I pop it off, I take the next number in the stack, pop it off, and then I can, and so that popped it off, and then I set the enemy position to being whatever x and y came back. Well, actually, I set my velocity to being the x and y that came back from the update, right? So my AI decides the direction I'm going to head, right? So if you have a look at the Lua here, it says return 1, 0, which is x, y, so it moves in the x direction. All right, so here I can return pairs, and they get pushed as a stack. And here I extract those pairs, right? So this calls the function, and then on the stack I pop them off and I set them. Right, so that's how C++ calls a Lua function, right, by setting up, setting up stack, pushing it up, and then it gets back the results and unpacks it and starts executing. Now because that, so when you, when you run your Lua interpreter, it puts all those functions into the Lua state. That's why I have to rerun the interpreter if I reload the file if I want to change the file and update things. It's not doing a load the file every frame. Because you can do that if you want your game to run really slow. You call Lua read file every frame because then it does file IO and it does interpretation and it sets it all up every single frame. Not a good decision, right? but one that makes it easy interactive. Um, if you want to do quick update, I usually use space key so I can reset, so I can do some coding in Lua and then I press space in the game and it will reload the Lua. Okay, and that's a quite a nice way of playing with your AI externally to your game engine itself. Right? It makes it very clear what is AI and what is game engine. Right? And so you've got those clear boundaries of clear APIs. It also means you can set your most incompetent memory handling programmer to deal with Lua because they never get to create objects and do crazy things and set graphics or screw up anything. They only have what you give them. Right? Which usually in a team, there's someone who's not a very good program. Okay, any questions? We've done our time? Ten past. So uh, if you guys have any questions, uh, we've got some students who are wondering about stuff. Um, we'll go back to the office, you can come and ask me there.
Uh, if you try losing the file under, um, when I said here, oh, this one, if you go to the 360 shared code, the most recent version is for Lua 5.3, most recent Visual Studio, and SDL2, and, and, and SDL Image, all the most recent versions. It's just that I haven't got them on this machine yet, and that's why it broke. Okay. Right, have a good Wednesday. Disappearing into the distance.